Um, great. So I'm going to be talking about um, sort of more massive dwarf galaxies than I think I'm known for. So my group studies all things dwarf galaxies, in particular uh, around the Milky Way. Um, but we've gotten more interested in sort of the, the larger scale environment. And so this is a talk, this is actually a new talk for me, so it's kind of exciting. Um, I typically am talking about ultra faint, very, very, very faint galaxies around the Milky Way, things that have stellar mass of like 10 to the 2 and 10 to the 3, kind of ridiculous things to be calling galaxies. Today I'm going to be chatting about things that are a bit more massive, 10 to the 8th, 10 to the 9th in stellar mass, sort of SMC, LMC analogs. Um, and the work I'm talking about uh, is stuff that we started a couple years ago and has really kind of uh, gotten exciting in the last even couple of months. Uh, and I'll be highlighting as I go through work by a couple of students. Jeremy Bradford is a PhD student, so half of this stuff is his PhD student uh, work. And then Kareem El Badri, who I'll also mention again later in the talk, is an undergrad who is applying here for graduate school. Um, and has been doing some really spectacular stuff on the theory side. And so, uh, and this work is also, Mike Blanton has uh, been a, a huge um, help in all of this, and Andrew Wetzel uh, highlight some of his stuff. I, so I'm going to start with my conclusions. I don't remember if this is like a Princeton uh, tradition, or it's, it's, I can't, but anyway, so I'll, here. Um, so I'll start with the conclusions. I came in really late last night, and I may get tired by the end of the talk, so like, let's just do this first. Um, and I'll come back to this slide at the very end. So the conclusion of my talk will be that massive, uh, low mass galaxies, dwarf galaxies, again around 10 to the 9th, um, require the presence of a massive galaxy in order to uh, quench star, forming, star formation. That is, low mass galaxies cannot turn star formation off on their own. Um, so to just be a little bit more specific, um, there's a stellar mass threshold below about 10 to the 9th, below which quenched galaxies just don't exist in isolation. And quenched galaxies that are at this mass scale are only found within about four virial radius of a massive host. Four is interesting. It's not one virial radius, so that says something. To me, this is interesting in that in terms of galaxy formation, which is a very messy business, and usually you know, there's a lot of hand-waving, this is quite a boundary condition. This is it's probably maybe the most um, you know, clear-cut boundary condition in galaxy formation. And so I find this really uh, pretty interesting. Um, going beyond, this is work that we uh, published a couple years ago. Going beyond that, we've gotten really interested in these isolated star-forming galaxies. Um, and we've been looking at their gas content. And we find that these objects have incredibly high gas fractions, up to 98, 99% gas, with the stars just sort of being a, a, you know, barely anything in terms of the, the baryon content. But the fraction varies pretty significantly. So from 30% gas up to 98% gas, and we don't, quite understand yet what sets that fraction, um, but I'll have a couple ideas there. And then um, connecting this back into theory, uh, we've, uh, some of us have started doing, looking at hydrodynamical simulations in the same mass regime, trying to understand uh, what's going on. And what these simulations suggest is that there's an enormous amount of variability on mega year timescales, on very short timescales. Um, and that you have to sort of take into account when understanding this particular mass uh, regime. And oh, I added a fifth point um, here, which I'll add at the end. Um, at the end of the talk, I'll, I'll try and connecting this back into um, the dark matter halos and trying to connect the dark mass to the baryon mass, specifically looking at the Tully-Fisher relationship um, and a couple of words of uh, caution about Tully-Fisher. Okay. So to motivate all of this work, um, for me at least, I start in the Milky Way um, because that's where uh, a lot of what I've done. So starting in the Milky Way, um, you know, around the Milky Way in the last couple of years or since um, you know, 2005, 2006, the number of satellite low mass galaxies around the Milky Way has doubled. And in fact, um, that's all coming out of the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. In the past couple of months since March, that number has doubled yet again. These are all low mass objects. And what's amazing around the Milky Way is that with the exception of the Magellanic Clouds, every single galaxy is quenched, is not forming stars around the Milky Way. And this is true around M31 as well. Um, and so just, it, it's kind of interesting. We think about, um, you know, 
uh, all these these satellites, all these satellites have been affected by their environment, presumably. They're in the, the Milky Way environment. And so again, with the exception of magical cosmic clouds, which we think are just coming in for the first time, um, all of the satellites are quenched around the Milky Way. And so often, particularly in this ultra faint business, people are trying to understand the dwarfs and understand their um, uh, evolution. These are not pristine objects. You know, they are forming around the Milky Way and so have been very much affected by, by their environment. Um, that's the Magellanic clouds there. But that's the, t the mass scale that I'm going to be talking about, the Magellanic clouds. So around the Milky Way, in fact, the quench fraction is zero down to 10 to the eighth in stellar mass because the Magellanic clouds are both star forming. So down to small Magellanic clouds, the um, number of galaxies that are quenched are zero. But as you go lower and lower, the quench fraction starts to increase um, dramatically. As you move out in distance, so here we go. Yep. So we move out in distance. So this is absolute luminosity, brighter things on this side, fainter things here. As we move out in distance, um, this idea that quenched galaxies are uh, only around massive objects persists. So blue are sort of star forming things and as you go into the color scheme into red, you'll notice that there's a bunch of red things uh, here at about what, three or four megaparsecs. This is the M81 group is the next more ma most massive um, primary. And so this is something that's a little bit more massive than the Milky Way. And again, all of the quenched galaxies are around M81. So sort of this idea that low mass galaxies need a massive galaxy to quench uh, persists. Um, so again, the pre preferentially preferred uh, dense environments, since this is not a, a new idea. Um, to quantify sort of quenched versus star forming galaxies and talking about environment, uh, I at least prefer to talk about this idea of central versus satellite um, galaxies. And this was an idea that's been around for a while. For me, it was crystallized in this paper by Andrew Wetzel and uh, Jeremy Tinker a couple of years ago. So the idea is, is that you, know, you, have, you can break galaxies into two different camps, either satellite galaxies, so galaxies that are within the virial radius of a larger, more massive galaxy, or uh, central galaxies um, that you know, is the, the most massive galaxy within its own virial radius. And this plot, so this is as a function of stellar mass. This is the quenched fraction, so just the, the number of things that are not star forming versus everything. And if you just concentrate on this black dashed line, these are for central galaxies. You'll note that as you go to lower and lower stellar masses, the quenched fraction uh, decreases. For satellites, it's sort of interesting. This is galaxy conformity. That is, depending on the mass of your host, the uh, fraction of satellites that are quenched uh, increases, which is sort of interesting. Just again for reference here, because of uh, in stellar mass, so the Milky Way is uh, a few times 10 to the 10, kind of sitting what right about here. SMC is 10 to the 8, so way off this plot. What we were interested in asking specifically for the central galaxies is, you know, if you take this line and you just kind of keep going down, at some point maybe this gets zero, maybe it uh, flattens off, and we were interested what would happen. This is all SDSS data, and the reason that this cuts off at a few times, uh, or many times 10 to the ninth, is that if you go to the Sloan Digital Sky Survey and you ask for a 10 to the ninth galaxy, you'll get a bunch of dwarf galaxies, you'll better get it, but you'll get 30 or 40 percent of shredded up massive galaxies. And that's just because, the, as you guys probably know quite well, the, um, the Sloan pipeline was um, designed for small, higher redshift stuff, and it takes a big galaxy and it just rips it to shreds um, and creates a whole bunch of not dwarf galaxies. But it's a very messy business. And so Mike Blanton and many others uh, uh, went through and re-reduced the nearby galaxy catalog to sort of unshred stuff, which allows us to push down to lower masses. Um, it has this unfortunate name that you may see. It's the NASA Sloan Atlas, which is NSA Atlas. Um, and that name, we started using that name before the NSA came into the popular literature, so I'm sure they're reading all of my emails. Um, okay, so just to put a little bit of framework in terms of quenched and star-forming galaxies, 
there's many different um, ideas of how you quench galaxies, but I just want to put a couple of them in your head. So these are um, just simulations, mostly just for the rainbow, um, uh, by Romil Dave. And the idea is, you know, why are galaxies quenched? What turns star formation off in a galaxy? Again, two different, two different ways to do that. There can be internal processes. So internal processes like there's a hot gaseous halo that's maintained either by supernova or by AGN. Um, that hot gaseous halo uh, you know, prevents cold gas from, uh, or gas from cooling. Therefore, you can't form stars. Alternatively, you can have sort of external processes. So things like um, ram pressure stripping or uh, tidally induced um, star formation that uses up all the gas. Um, and so either internal or external processes. And at least in Ramil's model, and you can kind of see this here. So this is a measure of environment. This, or sorry, this is a measure of environment. And this is stellar mass in this direction. As you go to lower and lower stellar mass to, to smaller galaxies, the internal processes become less efficient, whether it's that you, you don't have an AGN or the supernova um, uh, feedback is not as strong. The prediction here is that smaller galaxies are not able to self-quench. They're not able to um, turn star formation off in their own, other, in another way of saying that they shouldn't exist in isolation. And so that's the test that we uh, were trying to, um, or that's the prediction that we were trying to test. Okay, so two or three slides just about the data. So this is this NSA NASA Sloan um, sample. This is all the spectroscopic survey uh, from Sloan. It's actually quite difficult to find a nearby low mass galaxy. So let's say out to you know, a nearby, so my nearby, this is maybe not your nearby, but without a, within 100 to 200 megaparsecs, a low mass galaxy photometrically looks very much like a slightly higher redshift high mass galaxy. So you must have spectroscopic data in order to find these objects. And so the next big push um, to do this is going to have to be something like DESI, the next generation of spectroscopic surveys. This is, you know, this can't be done photometrically. And I'll actually talk about, um, at, gal uh, at lunch today, I'll talk about a, a way that we're trying to get around this. But anyway, yeah. No, no, sorry, this is, this is Sloan. This so is Sloan gets process. everything, right. So okay. Sloan gets everything, um, and that's, you need either an everything spectroscopic survey, um, you know, or you have to be extremely clever. We're not clever, so um, we just, you know, <laughs> using the spectroscopy. Yeah. No, no, sorry, this is all spectroscopy. Okay. So this is, this um, limit here is the Sloan um, spectroscopic magnitude limit of 17.7. .7. Okay, so. Clearly, you know, we've got, if we're thinking about galaxies that have stellar mass of 10 to the 9th, 10 to the 8th, there's a volume issue here where we can see things that are 10 to the 9th out to much larger volume than 10 to the 8th. Um, and indeed, if we're talking about quenched galaxies, um, we can see a quenched galaxy out to much smaller volume at the same stellar mass um, as a, a, a star forming galaxy. We do corrections for all the, the volume stuff, and I'd love to talk about that, but I just chose not to here. Um, so this is the sample. We have quenched galaxies and, and star-forming galaxies around 10 to the 8th, 10 to the 9th. We now need to do some sort of uh, uh, estimate of their environments. And the way we estimate environment for these low-mass things is to ask, what is the distance away from a massive primary? So something like uh, a Milky Way-sized galaxy or larger. And this comes back to this idea of needing a spectroscopic survey. So this is a massive galaxy. This is 10 to the 10th or a little bit uh, larger in stellar mass. And there is one galaxy, one low mass nearby object in this field that's associated with that galaxy. You'll never find it except you know it's in the center. Um, so this is a, a low mass galaxy. Um, these are both roughly at the same distance. But you can tell just sort of by eye, it's very difficult to pick that out otherwise. This is only. 70 kiloparsecs away. So this is well within the virial radius of that galaxy. But again, really emphasizes why you need these spectroscopic data. Um, OK, so we've now determined some sort of physical um, distance away from a host. We have some way of calculating the environment. The next thing we need to do is define what a quenched galaxy is versus a star-forming galaxy. 
And so we do this using, again, the spectroscopic data. Um, so we look at two indicators of whether star formation is present, the H-alpha uh, line and uh, uh, the D4000 break, so the Balmer break, which gives you some estimate of stellar ages. Um, so this is for the observers out there. Uh, this is the H-alpha equivalent width. This is for that full sample that I showed you before. You can see there's a peak right around zero. These are quenched galaxies, and these are star-forming galaxies which show a range in uh, star formation rates. Um, this is this D4000 break, so older stars have larger Balmer breaks, um, and we draw a line and require that our quenched galaxies um, have low H alpha, so no ongoing star formation, and on average, older stellar populations. Um, and those are the, the quantity, the, the, um, how to quantify that. Okay, so now we can start doing science. Um, oh, well, not quite. I just wanted to show you images. Um, so if you do that, these are some of the star-forming objects. These are some of the quenched objects. You know, there's clearly some difference in morphology. Low-mass galaxies, sort of 10 to the ninth, tend to look something like this. They are puffier. They don't have uh, well-defined spiral structure. Some interesting physics going on there. Yes? Please do, Rowley. Mass distributions in terms of what? Oh, all those things, um, not really. These these, ten, these look centrally concentrated. I think it's more of a, a the colors. Yeah, no. Um, and I think these may even be lower mass than some of these. It's kind of random. Yeah. Okay, now we can do science. And this is a, a result that we published now a couple years ago. Um, so now I'm plotting the quenched fraction um, as a function of this distance away from a massive host. So this is now sep separating out in terms of stellar mass. So 10 to the, or, uh, to the 9.7, so something a little bit more massive than the LMC. Um, as you get in towards a massive host, the quench fraction increases. Note that here we're only getting up to about 30%. In the Milky Way, uh, well, in the Milky Way, uh, the LMC is right about here, uh, would be 100% quench fraction. As you move out, there is a distance at which this seems to flatten off. And sort of in the ambient field, the quench fraction seem to be about sort of 5 to 10 percent. As we move down in stellar mass, something kind of interesting happens. So 10 to the 9.5, 10 to the 9. Again, you see the quench fractions increase as you get in towards a, a more massive host. But all of a sudden here, we're coming out to something like you know, very close to zero, or, or this, this um, field population seems to uh, have disappeared. What do you define it? So the word field is loaded. Everyone has a different definition. So what is your definition of field? So my definition of field, yeah. So this is my definition of field. A field galaxy, in this case, is just something that's beyond 1.5 megaparsecs of a of primary host. Yep. So I, I actually know. So we just kind of stop measuring those things. Because at some point, you know, 10 megaparsecs away from a massive object, there aren't that many that isolated objects. At 10 to the ninth, remember 10 to the ninth, we have lots of galaxies in the in dwarfs. things that are like voids. Yeah, we're talking about dwarfs. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay, so I'm going to call these galaxies fields. And now if I just plot those field galaxies as a function of stellar mass, um, this gets to the question that I asked earlier. So these are just isolated field galaxies, central galaxies. Um, this is the massive sample. This is Jeremy Tinker's sample. So again, 10 to the 11, 10 to the 10. The quench fraction is coming down close to zero, but the, the full Sloan sample isn't able to answer if it actually hits zero. This is using this NASA Sloan atlas. Um, so you can see um, these are the red points are ours. And you can't tell what the heck's going on at zero, so I'll do a log scale. Those are the same data on both sides. Um, and here as we hit 10 to the 9, all of a sudden these become upper, um, upper error bars. That is, and this is going up just because the volume um, is smaller and smaller, so our statistics aren't as good. So what I'm trying to say here is that there are no galaxies 
less than 10 to the 9 that are quenched. And you'd be like, eh, whatever, like that's not that many objects. This is a huge number of objects. So zero, zero out of 3,000 galaxies um, below 10 to the 9 are quenched. So we really would have had to, you know, I mean, like, it, it, you know, it could have been a couple. There's none. And so this is a fairly robust result. I would love statistics of 10,000 or 100,000, um, but this is the full Sloan catalog. So um, really quite a robust result. And so I'll draw a box around that, <laughs> right? So there's a stellar mass threshold below 10 to the 9th in which these quenched galaxies are not existing in the field. And this, to me, again, is a real boundary condition, at least in the local universe, um, on galaxy formation. Whatever you're trying to do to quench galaxies cannot happen below 10 to the 9. Now, this is, you know, we're only going down to 10 to the 7th here. So down, if you continue to, like, my favorite ultra-faint galaxies, which are 10 to the 3, it's possible that this quench fraction does, in fact, increase in the field, but we're talking about many, many orbiters of magnitude and stellar mass lower. Yeah, uh, okay, so great, awesome, low surface brightness. Um, so this has, the, we're definitely missing the lowest surface brightness things here. Um, that said, we're missing them nearby, um, you know, in towards other galaxies as well. So we don't, I don't think that there's a huge population of extremely low surface brightness objects in the field. This is sort of, um, you know, this dragonfly and all these new ex crazy low surface brightness things that are being found in clusters just in the last couple of months. There's a paper last week that, I, or f in Fornax, I think there was like a thousand new extremely low surface brightness things. Those are being found in clusters. It's not been done as systematically in the field, but um, talking to Peter Van Dokum, who's been doing this in, in um, coma, they're not seeing them in the field, and they have data that's almost as deep. And so I can't tell you that there isn't a low surface brightness population in the field, but indications are that there, there doesn't seem to be. Um, okay, so, so far I haven't talked about, you know, what are the hosts associated with each one of these. And so I can take the same data and flip this um, and ask, what is the quenched, the quenched galaxies and the star-forming galaxies in terms of distance away from their host galaxy in terms of virial radius? Yes. Yep, so that's my, that would be my internal versus external. So like M32 kind of thing. So, so M32, M32 is, is quenched and it's really close to its primary. Um, M32 should have been found in Sloan in that they might have been targeted in the stellar catalog as well. They're not, as far as I know, they're not there in the, I mean, they're not there in the stellar catalog. Um, and so there doesn't seem to be M32s, at least by Sloan's definition, um, in the field. So it's interesting. Um, you know, M32 has clearly been affected by its environment. So um, it doesn't seem like those, those super high surface brightness things would be in this, sam in that sample, in the field sample. Um, so if you had an M32 in the stellar catalog, you'd have gotten a, uh, presumably a galaxy redshift. Um, because they, I mean, the, the, you know, you do, you do stellar and galaxy templates. And so, um, you know, we, I have looked, you know, this, we, we just looked at galaxies, but I've looked in the stellar catalog and the, there aren't that many galaxies in the stellar catalog. So, so, okay, so now looking at the quenched galaxies as a function of radius from their host in terms of the virial radius of the host, um, here are for the quenched galaxies. And so if I just ask where are 90% of the quenched galaxies, they're within about two virial radius um, of their host galaxy. So for the Milky Way, the virial radius is 300 kiloparsecs, so they're within 600 kiloparsecs. Um, and there's a, you know, a fairly low number out here. There's, I, I keep forgetting to look at that one guy, I'm sure. Um, it's, this is dramatically different for the, the star-forming fraction. So for the star-forming galaxies, if you ask how far away are they from their nearest um, uh, primary galaxy, only about 45% are within two virial radius, and majority are, are well farther away. 
And this is all 10 to the 9th and lower. Yeah, 10 to the 9th and lower. Um, so you know, here is where that statement in my conclusions come from, that dwarf galaxies require a nearby galaxy to quench, but not like super nearby. Right? It's not within one virial radius. It's within two to four virial radius, which I think is interesting um, in that you know, there is something going on beyond this, a single virio radius to quench some of these objects. You know, this is two, two virio radius versus one. This is doing like abundance matching and um, the stellar mass of the host um, and, and doing abundance matching and figure out the virial radius. Um, this is using, th we were using the Beruzzi um, abundance matching. Um, I forget what Beruzzi, what the, the over in, what, what he uses. Yeah, I agree with that. But it's certainly not, you know, it's, this is a factor of two, these are two virial radius. So we can actually um, take this result and say something back in the Milky Way, which is sort of my home. Well, it's all of our home, but you know what I mean. <laughs> um, it, it, my research home. So this is looking for the Milky Way satellites as a function of distance away. Milky Way and M31, actually. This is distance away from the primary, so whether Milky Way or M31. And this is the amount of H1 gas, which is a proxy for whether star formation is going on. Um, and what you'll note here, these are mostly upper limits in close, I'm sorry, this is log, um, close to the, um, the primaries. And then there's objects out here that have lots of gas. And note this is log, right? So these objects really don't have any gas. Um, the viral radius, so these things are, are star forming and have gas. The viral radius of the Milky Way is right about here. And there's been these two galaxies that have annoyed the heck out of me for you know, like 15 years. These two guys out here, Cetus and Tucana. These are at many at two or three viral radius from the Milky Way. Um, they're quenched. They have pretty old star formation histories. There's always been a question of how do you get these things out here when most of the population is star forming. And until our results, you know, there were three possibilities of how you get this. One, there's some magical long distance quenching mechanism going on um, that is quenching these two objects, but not those. Two, these things are backsplash galaxies. That is, these two objects, not these, these two have somehow, at some point in the past, been closer to the Milky Way and they're on orbits that have just brought them out away from the Milky Way. And then a third, popu a third idea is maybe that these are some part of a quenched field population. Right? And so our results, because these objects are 10 to the 8th, our results apply here. Um, and we can at least cross out one of these possibilities. And at least in astrophysics, in my mind, being able to cross out one possibility is progress. So, like, we're happy. Um, I th the idea that these objects are backsplash galaxies is gaining some traction. The fraction, you know, here, this is about 10% of that population. If you look at the orbits co in cosmological simulations, something like 10% of the galaxies out at two or three Vera radius have orbits that have brought them in closer to the Milky Way in the past. Um, so that seems likely, but it's uh, you know something to think about more. Okay, so switching gears now a little bit, what we've started wanting to think about is you know what's going on with these isolated galaxies. Um, so now just exclusively focusing on the, the isolated galaxies, um, you know these objects are in the field. They have had less you know less interactions, and so in some sense they're an interesting control sample to understanding galaxies across all environments. They still will have interactions. You know, even in, if you're in the field, you're not truly in isolation at any point just because of the particle structure. Um, but we wanted to study these in a bit more detail. So this actually goes in two directions. I've decided to focus here on the star forming objects. Um, Jenny and I have started to think in the other direction in looking at the least massive quenched galaxies and ask what are turning those objects off. I don't have any answers there, so I decided not to include it. Um, but those are really interesting as well, and whether or not AGN are, are, are part of that story. But looking at the, just the isolated star forming objects, we wanted to dig into these a little bit deeper. Um, and again, these are opportunities to study maybe like the intrinsic properties of how these lower mass galaxies are forming, where intrinsic is in quotes. Um, to do this, we need to understand the gas component of these galaxies. Sloan only gives us the stars. This is only a small percentage of the um, total baryonic mass. Um, and so what we needed to do is go and get the gas masses for these objects to really start asking questions about them. So this is where Jeremy Bradford, um, who's a third or fourth year, gra fourth year graduate student um, at Yale has come in. Um, 
his thesis, the first couple of years of his thesis, has just been going to Arecibo, to Puerto Rico a lot, um, to get H1 observations of these lower mass galaxies. And so I'll talk about his work for the next couple of slides. Um, OK, so there has been a fair amount of work um, using H1 surveys. So the sort of the, the gas equivalent of Sloan is the alfalfa survey. The alfalfa survey is a, um, an H1 all-sky survey using uh, one of the instruments at Arecibo, which measures um, the H1 neutral gas. Um, and again, interestingly, um, th this is well matched to Sloan. So here is the mass in H1 as a function of distance. And I may, should have maybe made this in distance. But these are the alfalfa measurements. Um, very similar, very complementary to our Sloan um, sample. Jeremy has gone through and re-reduced the full alfalfa data set. Um, and just for like three people in the room, this is, is really critical. The alfalfa data, um, the, you, what you get is you get a, a, essentially a peak of H1, a, a Gaussian peak. Alfalfa has reduced this by taking undergrads um, and deciding where the edges of those Gaussians are. Um, it sounds crazy, but in fact, when you have confusion, um, undergrads are more efficient. Um, the problem with undergrads is it's really hard to calculate error bars. And so uh, what Jeremy has done for these isolated samples is gone through and automated the process of measuring H1. And we can measure robust error bars, which is, which is really critical for this sort of work. Um, in addition, because alfalfa is a, um, a flux-limited sample, we've gone through and measured H1 for the full isolated sample. And so we've just added a whole bunch of data points, or in some cases, upper um, uh, in some cases, error bars um, to this data. So we now have H1 uh, measurements for all the isolated low mass galaxies in the sample. Um, and in addition, we've measured some things that are in uh, a little bit more dense environments. And so to show that, this next plot, and we'll spend some time on this, this is my favorite plot of the talk. So this is now, again, stellar mass. And this is now the gas fraction. So the fraction of gas versus stars plus gas um, in a galaxy. So just what is the, the, the baryon fraction in gas in these objects? Red are the isolated points, and black are the um, are objects that are, um, are satellite galaxies. Um, and what you can see is a couple things. So first of all, there's a region for high mass galaxies that is essentially uh, is, 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 is vo devoid of galaxies. So for a stellar mass of 10 to the 10.5 for a Milky Way, there's a maximum gas fraction that you can reach. And, and this region, higher gas fractions are not allowed. Another way to say that is Milky Way mass galaxies are very good at turning their gas into stars. They're sort of an efficiency. And so these objects all have gas fractions that are 20, 30 percent. Um, another point in this plot. Um, so star formation efficiency is, is clearly lower in the dwarf galaxies. As you go to lower mass, things have more um, of their baryons in gas. They're less efficient in turning things into stars. What I find really interesting, and I have no interpretation for at the moment, is again at this stellar mass threshold where things are all star forming in the field, is right about where you get um, this sort of maximum gas fraction. So the gas fraction here um, essentially saturates. Um, and you can get gas fractions that are up at 99% gas at the same stellar mass where you have this threshold. That's interesting. I don't have an interpretation for that, but I, I, it's kind of cool. Um, and then what is not quite as obvious that I need to point out here um, is that for the isolated sample, so just concentrating on red points, there is um, a lower limit, or there's a, a um, we find none of our isolated galaxies have gas fractions that are less than 30%. Um, and so all of the things that are forming stars have at least 30% of their baryons in gas. But there's a huge range um, in terms of what they can are allowed to have. So from 30% up to 99%, which is really interesting. And try correlating that with kind of everything you can think of. There's no obvious. Uh, thing going on in terms of why uh, you know the gas fractions can be all over the place, um, but uh, it, yeah, go ahead. So this, is cold. this is cold gas. Cold yeah. Gas. Yeah. Um, over stellar plus cold gas. Yeah. So we not make not, not in terms of the halo. We'll get to the halo. We'll get to the halo. We might get to the halo. Um, 
Yeah, this is just cold. Now, um, the, the low mass dwarfs don't have a lot of ionized gas. There's not a whole lot of measurements that they don't. And they have some molecular gas, but the, the corrections there are pretty minor. So this is probably a good chunk of the gas. So we're getting all of the, the H1 beam, the H1 beam is larger than the optical radius. And so it is presumably all of the gas in these objects. We don't have estimates for the H1 radius, which kills us. Um, it kills me just personally, like emotionally. Um, uh, so we think that we're getting all of the gas. It's like three or four times the optical radius is the typical H1 beam. by the stars plus the gas. Right. So when you look at the parallel mass, the parallel mass is the distribution of the gas. No, no, the, so the stellar mass is, you know, if you have low stellar mass, you could have the same amount of mass in gas and have high or low. Uh, yes, absolutely. Yeah, and we see um, for, and this is not obvious in this plot, and I, I don't want to take time to explain it exactly, but for the black points, our, our sample is not complete and is absolutely biased against finding things in this blue region. So there's lots of things, um, satellites that have no gas. Yeah. But we have every single isolated galaxy we have an observation for, and we either have, in a few cases, upper limits, but in most cases, we have detection. Um, OK, so isolated dwarfs, dwarfs seem to all have greater than 30%. So. Um, we can now start doing lots of cool stuff. We can now correlate things and do uh, scaling relationships and all this sort of thing. And I will come back in about five minutes to talking about scaling relationships. So this is, um, we can now have an estimate of the dynamical mass from the H1. Um, so this is essentially the Tully Fisher. So this is the, the velocity width versus baryons. Um, what I want to do is pause for a second and, and do a little bit of a segue. Um, notice the scatter in these relationships is sort of interesting. And what I want to do is talk about the scatter in particular in, um, on this axis in the radius um, of these dwarf galaxies. I'll come back to these scaling relationships, I promise. Um, to think about this, we're going to go into simulation uh, to talk about hydrodynamical simulations for a moment. Um, so the hydrodynamic simulations that I'll be talking about were uh, just run by Andrew Wetzel. Um, so this is for Milky Way size things. This is force resolution, mass resolution of all the hydrodynamical simulations that have been done in the Milky Way so far. Um, and because uh, this are Andrew's simulations, his simulations, of course, are, are you know, really impressive in this, in this metric. Um, so these are um, fire simulations. This is Phil Hopkins' group. Um, and I, I think I have another slide just talking about all the parameters in this. Um, this is the new latte simulations, which are really amazing for the Milky Way. He has also run a bunch of simulations here, which we'll be most interested in, of dwarf galaxies. So you'll note that um, these are, this is the same code. Um, all these stars are the same code. You note the mass resolution has just gotten uh, two orders of magnitude better. The code didn't improve. Um, these are all much lower mass dwarf galaxies, and so if you're dealing with a much lower mass object, you can um, increase the resolution automatically, which is, I don't understand why more people don't simulate dwarf galaxies, but that's another issue. Um, and Kareem Abari is an undergraduate student who is uh, at Caltech this summer, has been analyzing um, these dwarf galaxies, um, and we're just finding just so many different amazing things in these simulations. Um, so providing high resolution view of these isolated dwarf galaxies, and these are all things that were isolated in a cosmological volume and then zoomed in on. Uh, I don't know much about, I don't understand much about these simulations. And so this is all of the physics that goes into them. And I'm just going to put that there and you can gaze at it for a minute um, and then not ask me any questions about it. Um, this is the interesting stuff. That, uh, so this is for one of uh, four simulations. These are at 10 to the 9 in stellar mass, so the same um, things that we've been talking about observationally. This is uh, a very quick snapshot. So this is only, this is basically at redshift zero over about half a gig a year. Um, this is the stellar distribution. I'm sorry, two times 10 to the eight. Stellar distribution. Because these are hydrodynamics, we can look at the gas mm -hmm. distribution. Um, these are the same snapshots. And then we can also look at the young stellar, the young stars where star formation is actually happening. 
Um, so the gas distribution, you'll note, does this um, idea that people have been talking about um, quite a bit in the last couple of years that you have an episode of star formation, the gas is blown out, um, it drags some of the dark matter with it, and then the gas starts to collapse down again and form multiple generations of stars. So there's this, um, you know, uh, sort of multiple uh, phases, or sorry, um, multiple bursts of star formation going on in these objects. Um, what's interesting and something that we've lo started looking at and we'll be publishing on really soon is that the gas is doing this sort of in and out motion. The stars are doing some of this as well. And the stars are being dragged both because they're forming stars out of this gas that has kinematics of uh, moving in and out, but also because they feel the same changing gravitational potential. And so the black line here is the observed effective radius of these galaxies. And you can sort of visually see that this is changing quite a bit. And if I plot this, um, so here is again log of stellar mass. This is the effective radius um, of dwarf galaxies. These are the four simulations, four dwarfs that have been simulated. Each of the set of colored points is a single dwarf galaxy plotted um, within a couple mega years. So this is the uh, one, this is half a giga year for each set of points. Um, the dotted lines are the observed scatter from the Sloan um, survey at a given stellar mass. And so what we're seeing is that the scatter in the simulation for a single dwarf over a pretty short time period can, if not explain all the scatter, it actually can explain quite a bit of the scatter, um, the observed scatter. So this is less, this is half a gig year. This is the, basically the same as I was showing um, in the snapshot. It's so, um, it may be a little bit of both. It may be a little bit of both. We're still trying to, because you can see the young stars right here um, definitely move around quite a bit as well. But the these are all on the same scale, right? So yeah, it's probably a little bit of both. Um, and that's something we should quantify. Yeah, it might. It, uh, I mean, so this is, so Kareem has just started um, uh, doing this starting in June. We have three papers that we want to write already. Another interesting thing is asking about um, anisotropies and just actual kinematics in the galaxy. Um, this predicts that the, there should be really massive radial anisotropy um, in these dwarf galaxies and not, uh, you know, I'm going to go to like two slides from now. Um, oops. So this, this property of this sort of breathing and this, um, you know, a lot of variation in a single object over time is peaking right around 10 to the ninth, at least in these simulations. And there are only like four or five of these simulations, so a lot of things that, uh, whatever. But this is, so these are three different, four diff this is the sp um, specific star formation history, this is radius, this is a couple other things. This is for a Milky Way mass object, this is as a function of age. This is for a lower mass, 10 to the eight kind of thing. And right around 10 to the ninth, the stochasticity as a function of time is peaking. Um, and that's, that's I think, where, what is what we need to follow, follow up on a lot more, is that something is going on right around this time, that's this mass range. The classical dwarf, yeah, I mean, they, they, there seem to be patches in multiple populations and that sort of thing. So the point here was coming back to these scaling relationships, which we now can talk about. Um, I now think about this effective radius, this scatter. I've always thought about this in terms of different galaxies having different properties and you know at the same stellar mass. Some of this I can now I start thinking about in terms of a single galaxy. If I came back, you know, a couple mega years later, a single galaxy can be scattering uh, quite a bit in this in this re these relationships. This, at least for me, is a fundamental shift in how I think about things. Yeah, because that's the, the first pl plot of things that I showed are the old star, all stars, so that includes old stars. Yeah, that's the key. Um, so the old stars have formed at, you know, they're born with these interesting kinematics, and so they're moving around. So the radial migration um, in these 10 to the ninth dwarfs are really interesting. In fact, we're finding that the 
aged gradients in 10 to the ninth dwarf can actually flip from the way that they, from what you observe, from the way they were actually formed. Um, so the paper that Kareem is finishing up this month is going to be called Radial Migration in Low Mass Galaxies, and that's what we're most fascinated by. These are all these are all bound, so the, all the baryons will stay in the galaxy. Um, well, so it's not blowout. So this is this is all in the baryons, and the baryons are sort of changing the potential enough so the the dark matter reacts to some of it, but it's not. We're not losing a massive amount of gas at each each one of these star forming episodes. So we're losing some gas, but it's only a few percent each time. Um, so there's a lot, there's a huge amount. So I bet Kareem, he's we've got four papers lined up for his senior thesis, right? Like um, what I would love to get to in like five minutes is to talk about the Tully Fisher relationship. Um, so the Tully Fisher relationship is trying to start connecting baryons to their dark matter halos. And so I, I, I do really want to talk about that for a bit. Um, so the Tully Fisher is essentially this axis um, and this axis. So let's plot this. Um, so Tully Fisher has been talked about enormously in the literature. Um, this is, uh, everyone's plotting it different ways. So the classic Tully Fisher relationship is the absolute luminosity of a galaxy versus the, the dynamical mass or some estimate of the dynamical mass. Um, so in this case, we're measuring the H1 line width um, as a proxy for dynamical mass. Um, and you can use this for a whole bunch of things. It's been used for distances, but it also should connect the baryons to the, to the dark matter halos. Um, and the slope of this has been talked about enormously in the literature, trying to ask, you know, how do you put baryons into, um, into, their, into their dark matter halos? Um, if you plot, let's say, the stellar mass as a function of this, low mass galaxies tended to fall off this relationship. They tended to, to not be on a linear relationship. And that's really obvious because most of their baryons are in gas, and so you're just missing a huge chunk of, um, of the available luminous mass. And so what we've been, uh, what we and I think everyone should be focusing on is the baryonic Tully Fisher. That is, let's add up everything that we could actually see um, and look at that as a function of the uh, stellar mass. And so we've gone off a little bit on a tangent, um, getting really obsessed with understanding the Tully Fisher relationship and what goes into this. And it turns out to be a really subtle business. Um, there are a huge number of systematics that go into putting these pl points onto plots. And so Jeremy's next paper um, is going to be looking at all of these systematics. And so for a single data set, the data set that I've been talking about so far, just the isolated galaxies as a function of stellar mass, both from low mass things up to high mass things. Um, he's asked, if I change every systematic that can go into the Tully-Fisher relationship, what does that do for the slope and the scatter of the Tully-Fisher? Um, again, the slope of the Tully-Fisher says something very fundamental about how you put baryons into galaxies. And the difference between a slope of, let's say, 2 to 4 um, changes the interpretation tremendously. And what we find is that depending on how we, uh, depending on what assumptions we make put to uh, put just our own data set on the Tully Fisher, we can get slopes that range all over the place. So for example, of our data just changing one systematic. So for example, um, the intrinsic flatness of a galaxy is something you need to assume. Most people typically assume a single number. We know that the intrinsic flatness changes as a function of stellar mass. And so here, right in the center, this fiducial is assuming a singer, single number that most people do in the literature. And uh, one of these numbers here, here, C, um, this is assuming that there is um, a linear relationship between the intrinsic flatness as a function of stellar mass. And so I actually thought this was going to be a tremendous change in the, um, the Tully Fisher actually doesn't move things all that much. And so each one of these data points is just changing one of these um, to see how much we can change the slope of the Tully Fisher. What we found, which is amazing, is that the biggest difference, so also note that this changes the slope a lot. The scatter doesn't change all that much. 
And what this is is that these, all these systematics tend to affect the dwarfs the most, and it's essentially a lever arm changing the slope of the Tully Fisher. And the scatter doesn't seem to change all that much. Is it the biggest difference between those two? Yeah. Yeah, so what the biggest difference is how you measure the velocity, how you measure the, the x-axis. And so if you measure it assuming, you know, these are really subtle, stupid things. Um, most people measure, let's say, the H1 line width down to 50% versus 20% of the total line width. Things change quite a bit. Alternatively, if you have r resolved rotation curves, things change quite a bit. And so the not particularly sexy um, result of this paper is that if you're going to do observations and measure, let's say, line widths using the 20% line widths, in the simulations you need to do the same thing. Right. And so if you go in the literature, and that's this second plot here. So this he's now gone into the literature and read every paper um, that has published a Tully Fisher slope, which I, is awful. Um, it really is. It's probably the, and I'm sure there's worse literature out there. But um, here he has plotted. This is the slope as reported in the paper. And then he split it off into how you measure the velocity width. Um, and again, you can see slopes of all over the place. Note, these are the MAGA points up there that have been um, used to argue against lambda CDM. And he argues that this is a, uh, has to be mon to get slopes that are all the way up here. That's another talk. Um, but depending on how you note that the, 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 um, these things are clustered a little bit. So how you measure the data get, uh, is the thing that gives you the slope. Uh, I'm, I'm rushing a little bit at this point. But uh, really, it ends up depending heavily on the velocity measurement. Um, but this goes back into the literature, and people have made a huge deal out of these different slopes. And it turns out you can get any slope that you would like. Um, so I'm now off my soapbox. I'm going to skip that and come back to the conclusions. Um, right, so um, hopefully I have uh, convinced you that there's this stellar mass threshold um, below 10 to the 9th that seems seem, things don't seem to be self-quenched. This was all presented in a paper in 2012. Um, We've now started looking at the baryon fractions and folding in the gas. And it seems that this gas fraction in isolation can vary quite a bit. Um, and we don't quite yet understand what's going on in terms of um, what sets the gas fractions. But looking in the simulations, so that's um, the next thing. Looking in the simulations, there's this huge variability in single objects as a function of fairly short time periods. And so I think these two things are probably coupled and will give us the answer. Um, both of these are. Uh, uh, the number three is presented in a paper a couple months ago. Four is coming out in a couple of months. And then this fifth point that I just added that in considering this Tully Fisher relationship, systematics really matter and really boring, subtle stuff really matters. Um, and so I'll just stop there. <laughs>